Good afternoon. My name is Stacia Stolk with Deep Roots. I am pleased to welcome you to our webinar, Big Bull Creek Park, A Plan Becomes Reality. Big Bull Creek Park is the largest park in Johnson County Park and Recreation District System, and it totals 2,060 acres. Located between Edgerton and Gardner in Southwest Johnson County, the park focuses on nature-based learning, play, and restoration. Led by field biologist Matt Garrett, learn about this massive project today from its master plan to its today reality. Before we get started, don't forget to ask questions with Zoom's Q&A tool and to make comments with its chat feature. At the end of the presentation, we will take a few minutes to answer some of the most popular questions. Matt Garrett is a field biologist with the Johnson County Park and Recreation Department. In this position, Matt is responsible for the management of wildlife, fisheries, and 8,700 acres of natural areas. He has extensive experience in large-scale prairie restoration, native seed collection, volunteer management, and pres prescribed fire. So please join me in welcoming Matt as he takes us on a virtual tour of Big Bull Creek Park. All right, thanks, Stacia. Like she said, I'm Matt Garrett with the Johnson County Park and Recreation District. <clears throat> And I am really excited to share with everyone uh, a little bit about Big Bull Creek Park today. This is gonna be a pretty informal presentation and I'd love to engage with folks at the end and have some lots of questions and, and talk about the process of what we did here and how we took it from just a master plan on paper to a functioning ecosystem uh, with lots of park visitors. So today we're gonna to talk about the land history. The site um, has some pretty cool history um, in regards to American history. We talk about the process of purchasing the land. We're going to talk about how the master plan happened and we ended up uh, with a kind of a nature-based large-scale park site. We're going to talk a little bit about the park development and how it came to be. We're going to talk about our natural resource plan and how it began to fund a lot of the work we're doing. And then we're going to continue to talk about the future of the Big Bull Creek Prairie Complex um, and what's happening with it in the future. Um, the photo you see there is uh, a couple of silos, which are pretty iconic on the site, and you'll see those later. Um, they're situated in the middle of our full-scale 500-acre prairie restoration, and so no matter where you are, when you're in the um, restoration zone, you always see those silos. So Big Bull Creek has some pretty interesting history, like I mentioned, um, with the Kansas-Missouri kind of border skirmishes before the Civil War. Um, there was quite a bit of activity in the area, and there was an actual Battle of Bull Creek just north of the site. 1856, um, some folks came over from Westport um, with some militias and James Lane and just a few um, people. He paraded them around so it looked like the Kansas um, Free Staters had a larger force than they did and were able to send um, the, the Confederate uh, militias back to, to Westport. Um, one of the first, if not the first, Catholic church in the Kanza territory was located um, on the park site. And uh, that, I believe, burned down at some point, and that moved into Edgerton. And there is a cemetery that is, that is owned by the Catholic church on the park site. Um, that They have a, an inroads, uh, they have a, a little easement of land that goes through it, and then they own the cemetery, and it's in the middle of the park. Uh, we have had some archaeological experts out, and they're quite a few evidence of Native American encampments along Big Bull Creek as early as 1200 to 1350. And we've done some surveys and some of the areas before they were converted uh, where we knew many lithic pieces were found. Um, we had them investigated um, before we lock those into prairie long-term so folks wouldn't be out looking uh, for arrowheads and fields. So the purchase of Big Bull Creek was a big deal. Um, there was a special referendum in 1998 where voters helped us buy that 19, 1980 acres. And at the time, uh, one of my supervisors, Bill Mawson, purchased from 24 different landowners. Um, so it took, a, it took a lot of work to tie all of these different pieces of land together. And the land sat um, fallow all the way until 2017. So in Southwest Johnson County, folks were um, starting to wonder what was gonna happen with this property. People were frustrated that it had been purchased and they just saw all this public land just sitting there and they were ready um, to see a park happen. 
And then recently we purchased an additional 80 acres and then got us over that 2000 acre threshold um, for the current size of the park. So we had to come up with a way to design this park site. And if you're not familiar with master planning, um, it's a pretty involved process where our planning department and consultants and park staff all get together and with public engagement, we reach out and we talk to people about what they want this site to be. And so multiple site visits with shareholders, you know, stakeholders in the area, um, talking to the public about what they want, visiting with, with all the consultants, we eventually kind of wrapped our head around the idea of seeing if we could, since we're working with so much land, could we manage these large areas for natural resources? The public were not interested in large scale soccer fields or baseball. Um, there was no interest for this large park site to, to be heavily you know, sports based or have lots of activity. So what we were hearing from the public was please preserve this site. And so the idea was to see how we could preserve, restore and manage it. And um, with the Audubon Society and talking with some other staff, we decided that if we could secure 500 acres as a core habitat zone for some of these prairie restorations, that's what we thought was a big enough piece of land that would really matter for grassland bird restoration, stabilizing some of those species. The Hillsdale Lake Corridor is just south of the park site. And so there's a huge amount of public land just southeast of the park site. Um, with numerous large habitat zones, but we wanted to make sure that we had big enough chunks of preserved space that um, wildlife would have a functioning ecosystem. And so we began to restore all the major habitats. We were looking at improving the Oak Hickory Forest, converting a lot of cool season grass to prairie, working on a savanna glade restoration. So our goal was take the site and restore it um, to all those major things you would see in Kansas. And we wanted to manage them long term with resiliency for a changing environment. So whatever we wanted to do here, we wanted to make sure we're thinking about um, with climate change and, and other activities over the, the future of the park site that make sure the decisions we're, we're making and the plant species we're putting on the ground are ready to, to shift. And so through that process, you create a lot of kind of interesting features and we started looking this park site um, is really unique and it's divided by three major roads and so the existing circulation with that red shows the noise coming off the rail lines in 56 highway and then the park is split in half um, by i-35 as well and you can see that we kind of formulated these noise zones of where um, there would be some disturbance from 18 wheelers and trains and things like that. But we've learned with uh, bald eagles nesting on the site that they nested within 25 yards of I-35. So um, some of the wildlife don't seem to care um, about humans being nearby. And then we broke up into habitat zones. Um, and all this work was done with a consultant named RDG. And um, we worked with Applied Ecological Services um, as well to help us formulate this plan. So we began to formulate an idea of prairie, savanna, forest, wetlands, and these big zones and where we could possibly begin piecing um, all this habitat together across the site. And so the initial vision for Big Bull Creek was a north zone, which included our wedding venue, Milldale Farm, where many people have maybe been to the Casey Wildlands Christmas tree cutting event, um, makes up a portion of that. The long-term vision for the site had a campground, a glamp ground um, for maybe a not quite primitive camping experience, some nature play, an off-leash dog area, um, disc golf course, and a park maintenance compound. And right now on that north end, we do have the disc golf course, we do have the park maintenance compound, and we have Milldale Farm. Future trails and off-leash areas will come with funding road. So the central zone just north of 35 has um, currently a large nature-based playground and it's got a paved trail network. We've got single track trail and then what we'll be talking about today are large prairie restoration area. And then our further southern zone is a lot more wild, very little development. There's currently only equestrian trail, single track trail, and um, 
connection into the Hillsdale Lake Corridor. And there is a Boy Scout campground that's rentable by youth groups. Um, so there's a camping zone down there, but it's a much quieter um, gravel road kind of existence down on the south zone of the property. So this was the long-term vision. If you built out the entire park site um, from day one, I believe you'd be spending upwards of you know, 15 to $20 million if you built the entire park out. Um, but we didn't do that. I think we spent around 7 million opening the park. Then your green graph you see over there is our existing cover. And um, if we started to convert that acreage, some of the costs, and we began formulating maybe down the road, if we did this restoration work, if we ever got funding, um, this is what it would look like. So um, the Board of County Commissioners increased our funding for the Park District, and we were able to get Big Bull Creek opened in 2017, which was really exciting for the community. It was really exciting for the Park District. Um, Johnson County government was ecstatic, so it was really neat um, to make the park happen. Um, there's a lot of long-term um, investment in the site, and people have been really excited um, to get the ribbon cut and get this you know, running on the park site. So it was a very special day for everybody. And a neat thing about that park site, if you haven't visited yet, is you when you get to the parking lot, you see native plantings that are very uh, formal, and you'll see things like coneflower and butterfly milkweed in a formal setting. And then you go to a nature playground, and the nature playground will have a little bit wilder native plantings. And then when you venture off a little further away from the kind of the structured nature, then you get to experience that same palette of plants out in the almost 400 acres of restored prairie we have so far. So um, the, the design team was able to come up with a neat idea to slowly integrate, integrate children and families into understanding nature and then getting out into the wild space. And then um, more funding became available for us to do a natural resource plan, which was a really exciting uh, for me as a natural resource professional. And we were able to inventory all 10,000 acres of our parkland but as part of that plan, we actually did a Big Bull Creek site-specific master plan, which instead of having just kind of a very general master plan for the park manager, uh, Dan Hayes and his staff, this gave manageable goals and costs along with it and began the process of giving us an idea of exactly how to do this work and how much it's going to cost. And so a neat thing that came out of that was we found out exactly what kind of habitat was on the ground at Big Bull Creek. And so Frank Norman, um, a subcontractor, was able to go out on site and he physically ground truthed the park site and figured out exactly how much of every kind of habitat was in the park, which is uh, fairly unusual for park systems in Kansas City to do this kind of work. And the thing that really jumps out at you is there's almost over 800 acres of non-native cool season grassland um, that is still available to convert. And we've got about a little over 300 at the time we made this graph of restored prairie. You can see some really high quality old deciduous forest in the riparian corridor, some young forest, um, but just it's glaring that the potential for prairie on the site when we made the master plan was immense. So if we just kept planting prairie um, we would have well over a thousand acres, at least half of the site could be a uh, tall grass prairie. And so this kind of information for park managers and land managers is really important so you can understand what you're working with and where um, your weaknesses are and what kind of habitat potential you've got. Um, to geek out a little bit, if you're a soil person, I know some people love soil types. Um, that plan also gave us a really good idea of uh, where all the soil was on the site um, and seeing all the different types. Um, we also looked at the slope analysis and things like that. Um, and then for park management, we broke the park up into 11 different management zones. And so each one of these zones can be managed independently and have work done in them. And we can forecast how much it is going to be to restore um, each of these zones and it makes work more manageable um, instead of being overwhelmed by a 2,000 acre park site. This breaks it up into bite-sized pieces that allows us um, to begin completing work uh, and getting these projects off the ground and not just uh, lose our minds trying to figure out if we're getting anything done. 
And one of my favorite things is not only do we have the land cover type of where all the habitat is, um, we actually were able to grade every habitat type. And it really gave us goals on how we could convert this land and then improve it with long-term monitoring and go back and adjust how we have rated it. And so all of our fresh, brand new weedy prairie restorations are a D. Um, some of our higher quality riparian areas are Bs or BCs. And the long-term goal is to A, convert a lot of the cool season and then begin to get the rankings of these different habitat types up higher. So we have lots of ambitious plans um, to continue overseeding some of these prairies, removing invasive species, and begin uh, to trend some of these different areas and these land cover types into higher quality habitat. So as a land manager, it's really neat to be able to see um, the best parts of the park and get an understanding of where the work needs to be done. Um, for example, we know the, the gorgeous old deciduous forest has a lot of garlic mustard in it. And so that's a big plan uh, for my staff this spring. Uh, we're going to be getting out and we're going to be chasing garlic mustard um, throughout the growing season. So bush honeysuckle is not a huge problem on this site. Um, many of our more urban park sites were fighting it um, really hard. Um, but here there is very little bush honeysuckle and we are able to actually jump around and uh, find the little infestations and get them under control. So through the natural resource plan, getting this land cover you know, map system built and then grading out all the habitat types has been really phenomenal. Applied Ecological Services um, was an immense help in getting this work done. And so we figured out if we did all the restoration and management for all the project zones, all 11 different management areas, we would be spending almost $6 million if we restored the entire park site oops, to uh, you know, pre-settlement conditions. And we almost spent that much just opening the park up to the public. So um, the idea of spending this much money is not something uh, that we have the funding for, um, but it gave you an idea if you really did want to improve and just make this park site a perfect location, you know, national park level, just habitat wise, we'd be spending almost $6 million. Um, but we know we couldn't do that. So we decided to come up with a more manageable plan. And we decided we have some really important areas that need work done, which includes restoring a savanna, removing cedars in a zone, um, getting our ponds cleaned up, restoring prairie. And we broke that out um, over the first five years um, and decided we would have some expensive upfront costs on a project you'd move into kind of a midterm cost and eventually we would have some, some lower costs as we move into more long-term management. So looking at just taking care of the worst problems in the, in the park, instead of spending almost six, we were gonna spend a little less than a million to get some of that work done. And we have begun this process removing numerous cedar um, thickets in the right of way uh, getting a lot of different areas cleaned up. And so the work on this project has begun um, with the funding of our natural resource management plan within the park system over the last couple of years. And obviously this work couldn't be done just by our Southwest park staff that have just been putting in thousands of hours into this project, there's partners involved. And so we've had the US Fish and Wildlife Service fund some of the work on the park site. Some of our initial prairie restorations before we got our internal funding did come from the US Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, the Miami County Conservation District has become a great partner. Leslie Rigney and her team down there have um, Hillsdale Lake watershed, you know, under their, their management and um, all of Big Bull Creek funnels into Hillsdale Lake. Drinking water for lots of people in Miami County um, comes from Hillsdale Lake and the Big Bull Creek watershed. So Miami County was pretty instrumental in helping us fund some of this prairie restoration because any of the old ag land, corn fields and soybean fields we lock down long-term um, helps water quality in Miami County. So looking at a kind of a two county area, they were able to help us on this project. Casey Wildlands that many of you are familiar with, um, their C team has been instrumental on the site as well. Uh, Deep Roots has helped spread the word about Big Bull Creek. Uh, so we've been able to work with Deep Roots on telling the story of this large scale restoration. And then 
partners like um, even Johnson County Public Works providing us seed drills like you see in the photo to get some of the large scale habitat drilled. Um, they provided us um, a cost share seed drill to get some of that work done. So we've had lots of partners at the table. So that Casey Wildland seed team um, actually worked with Miami County a year and a half ago, two years ago almost, to go to Miami County um, during a uh, five-star grant, find remnant prairies and collect seed, take it to our seed barn in Southern Johnson County, process it, and then we were able to put seed on the ground, remnant high quality prairie on a 40 acre patch last year um, at Big Bull Creek. Some really rare stuff, local ecotype that came from just south of the park site. And on top of us working and doing this work together, we were able to meet some landowners and Miami County was able to save some prairies and talk to people about conservation easements at the same time that we were getting seed. And so it was a great effort by Wildlands in Miami County. Um, but the seed team has been instrumental in getting that stuff to us. We get it processed and get it back out and make new prairie. Now we do have a mechanical seed stripper we use. You can see a resource technician there, Caitlin. Um, we have a pull behind unit that actually can scalp uh, native seeds. And when it's up high, it can get grasses and we can take it all the way down to the dirt and we can collect um, a lot of seed from Big Bull Creek for future work at Big Bull Creek. So we're getting to a point where we have enough habitat there that we can collect seed mechanically, um, clean it through a hammer mill. Once it's processed, it can actually go back out on the site. So we don't have the means for running combines, um, but this uh, mechanical seed stripper um, is quite the machine um, for doing small scale seed collection mechanically. And we were supposed to have it out in the field this week about the moisture and obviously that we've seen in the snow and the mud has not made that possible. But we can fill a 55 gallon drum in about 30 minutes um, and get that processed and then keep moving. Um, so the seed stripper has been a pretty cool tool. An important part of the project is adding diversity. So some of our initial prairie restorations may only have 40 or 50 species in them. And uh, we'll go out and use a seed drill or broadcast seed on the site, depending on the scale. Um, and then this previous year, um, Dan and his staff at Bull Creek did a lot of prescribed fire, burned a lot of early prairie restorations. And we went out this winter and we were able to broadcast new forb seed um, and try to add diversity to these sites. And so long-term with long-term monitoring, the goal is to continue to overseed, broadcast seed, burn, put more forb seed out and continue to hopefully add diversity to the site. Um, the photo you see is an example from Shawnee Mission Park where staff were doing the same technique. Um, I wasn't out um, to capture a photo at Big Bull Creek, but we use a fertilizer spreader and it's usually we try to get it onto snow and get all those wild type seeds on the ground. And then when the sun shines and melts and sucks that seed um, down in the ground and then the freeze thaw cycle can work its magic. And so we've had good success adding diversity at smaller sites. Uh, and we have not begun charting um, long-term monitoring at Big Bull Creek yet, um, but we're gonna begin that next year. We'll be looking at three sites within Big Bull Creek long-term and, and see how we hope that by adding diversity, we'll start seeing things trend in the right direction. Another big partner um, are the Kansas Master Naturalists. And they've been instrumental on Big Bull Creek for a few different things. Um, we do have a bluebird trail on the site and um, they help orchestrate that. Mickey Lewis, a volunteer, uh, helps with our breeding bird surveys. We are seeing Henslow sparrows, we're seeing grasshopper sparrows. Um, we have all kinds of amazing grassland birds on the site. And we have begun, we've done two years of our breeding bird survey that Mickey runs for us with park staff. And so the goal is from day one to do these breeding bird surveys. And Betsy Beatros uh, and the Master Naturalists have been instrumental in us doing butterfly surveys as well. Um, and the photo on the top there is from this year, we had a socially distant uh, butterfly survey at Big Bull Creek and they went out and uh, used every means necessary to try to survey as many butterflies and moths as they could. And we're also gonna continue doing that survey we hope yearly um, for as long as the park site is managed. So 
These are cool opportunities for citizen scientists to get out in the field and expand the reach of what the park district does. And so um, we love having partners and doing these breeding bird surveys and the butterfly surveys and monitoring the bluebird houses because the park staff in the Southwest region are very limited. Um, you've got a 2000 acre park uh, with less than five people managing it. Um, and then our natural resource staff of, of three to five, depending on the time of year, come down and help as well. So we really love having these important volunteers on site. So um, last year I mentioned we did have that five-star grant and we were able to get 80 acres, an additional 80 planted. We were able to get two large tree lines removed uh, mechanically. We were able to get a bunch of cedar removed. And our total currently is 380 acres um, of our initial 500 acre core prairie is on the ground. So this next growing season, we're gonna have an opportunity to do probably another 120 acres. And it's kind of like a big quilt and we're, we're missing pieces and we're gonna quilt a bunch of little you know, stitch pieces together and hopefully be at that 500 acre mark on this restoration project. This winter will just be burning and overseeding. We tried to take a year off um, and not plant any more habitat. So last winter we put 80 on the ground. This winter is gonna be all about fire and continuing to remove trees and fence lines and manage the habitat we have. And then we're gonna jump back into it um, next winter and see what we can get done. So here is a quick and dirty map of the park site and that in green are things that are already planted. Yellow is things we put into habitat last year. And um, it shows you how we're just stitching these pieces together and slowly but surely we can remove tree lines, we remove uh, successional fields with Bradford pear and locust and we just start tying together all these pieces of property. Um, and you can see I-35 is a substantial hindrance um, for moving through the park. The original master plan had a prairie bridge. We were gonna have a habitat corridor that would have spanned um, all four lanes of I-35. Obviously doing something like that over the interstate would have cost more than the entire park development, so that didn't happen. But we do have single track trail that goes under I-35. And you are able to hike all the way from the letter A at the park entrance and go up by the quarry and follow the gorgeous riparian corridor and get all the way down to the Miami County line about eight miles of single track. And so Urban Trail Co and park staff and professional trail builders that work for us have worked really hard at getting under I-35 and creating a link um, to put the whole um, central and southern parts of the park site together for public use and getting us access to managing invasive species and in problem areas. Um, so the whole central and southern region are currently connected with trail, um, but my, my prairie bridge dream is not quite a thing yet. So maybe down the road we could have our monarch butterfly, um, you know, wildlife habitat corridor over the interstate with tall grass prairie. Um, if somebody wants to fund that, I'd appreciate it. So fire management um, at this scale is not something that the park system had ever done. Um, our staff are highly trained and, you know, have a good background in wildland fire, um, but burning 200 acres or 300 acres, like Flint, Flint Hills style fire, it's not something our park staff had done before. And Dan and Jamie and the, the Southwest crew have worked really hard um, at, at building up the equipment. And then my staff have uh, developed a brush skid. So we now have a brush truck equal to what the fire departments have. We have multiple UTVs with uh, 50 to 75 gallon sprayers with foam on them. Some of these fields are large enough that the person running the drip torch gets really tired by the end of the fire. And so we've really mechanized our equipment using a lot of mechanical means. We have really good radio systems and we work really closely with the fire department. Um, wind is super important at Big Bull Creek with I-35, 56 highway, the city of Edgerton and the New Century flyway um, and the Gardner airport. Um, making sure the smoke on the site goes where it needs to go is really important. Um, prescribed fire is incredibly dangerous for staff, um, but everyone is really well trained, great PPE and we continue to have um, really safe prescribed fires. Really wide mow lines, um, 
when we make our fire breaks at Big Bull Creek, we are making them at least 35 to sometimes 40 feet wide. Usually you wanna have your fuel breaks three times the, the height of your tallest fuel. And so if we're talking 12 foot big blue stem, you are talking well over 30 feet. We have seen fires with wind lay over a two lane road. And so we are extra cautious with our fire lines on this site. And we continue to buy additional fire skids and equipment for staff because um, these, these fires are something that, you know, we take pride in doing right and keeping every fire district happy with the way the park system um, does our prescribed fires. So fire management is really cool. Um, when it comes to drones, we've been able to pull drones onto the site and our marketing staff have been able to follow us and, and allow us to kind of make teaching tools with the drone footage of how these fires go. So I have a little bit of that drone footage that we're gonna look at here on the park site. And so this is looking at the Sunflower Road entrance and that is where that nature play area is. And this is where the visitor to the park site is gonna see an initial prairie. And you can see across the street, it's currently agricultural land um, on the west side of the road there, but we know eventually that's gonna be houses or warehouses or it is not gonna be um, future parkland. And so it was important to get as much of this habitat locked down um, before development occurred. So you can see the entrance to the Sunflower Road part of the park system there. And you can see that we have about a three-year-old prairie restoration. And right now, this was taken just about a month ago. You can see the big wide mow lines around this. The, the staff are itching to burn this field. And um, it's prepped and it's ready to go. Um, to the left, you see a tree line. And long-term, we'd like to pull some of these tree lines out and put wet prairie in some of those spots. And that has just not been something we've gotten to yet. So long-term, a lot of tree lines in riparian corridors out in the prairies are gonna come down and you're gonna see things like prairie cord grass and other wetland species going in. So we're pivoting and we're looking to the east and towards I-35. Um, you can see lots of sunflowers blooming last month on the site. And that's, we call that Mount Edgerton. That's that quarry over there to the north of the park site. And so these fingers of trees will eventually come down and we're gonna make riparian corridors through there um, with those kind of swampy wet prairies. And you can see as we pivot, this is just a nice big triangle of about, this is a three-year-old prairie restoration. And we're gonna pop over this next tree line here and see another restoration. And this is where the public can see on that paved trail, you pop out and you go from that formal playground and you're able to look out over these larger restorations and get an idea of exactly how immense some of this site is. And so um, the paved trail network is not very large but it gives you an idea of the scale of the site. And so currently, if you start on the far east side of the site, you can walk over a mile straight in tall grass prairie, as you can see from this image. Um, that's me and my little white truck there with the drone. Um, but all of what you see um, has been converted into tall grass prairie. And you can see the field that we're about to pass into has a lot of Indian grass, while the other field that we're currently flying over has a lot of forbs from the color of the field. And uh, yeah, there we are with the drone. And uh, you can see this is about an 80 acre field that we're flying over currently. It was in corn about six years ago. We got it into soybeans, its final growing season as agricultural land. And then we jumped in here. You can kind of see the shadow of the old terraces on the site. And then there are those iconic silos in the background. And then you're gonna see some that fire line cut across this. We're not gonna burn all 80 at once. We're gonna burn 40 and then burn another 40. Um, one more challenge with managing a site like this is we do have large power lines. Um, Evergy has been a partner on the project and Evergy has come out and helped us remove cedar trees, fence rows and things like that. Um, so we planted the 80 under the power lines last year. This was a former farm, and so the area around the silos hasn't been converted yet, but that's one of those little pieces that we're gonna continue stitching together. And I think we have 60 or 70 burn piles that are gonna be burned this winter on the site. And you'll, you'll see burn piles ever so often. And then pivoting over, you can see that immense quarry that is our neighbor to the north. And so really the drone footage gives you a real idea 
of just the absolute kind of size of the site. That cemetery I mentioned very early in the presentation is going to be um, just ahead of us in this photo. And so we don't own the cemetery, but it is surrounded by parkland and has that easement that the Catholic Church gets into their cemetery site there. And now um, we are moving east on the park site. We're about to go over the power lines where we did that 80 last year. And we're going to head over and, and see a site that we put down an immense amount of remnant prairie seed last year. It'll get burned for the first time this year. And we're hoping to see all of that local Miami County seed coming up. Many of the larger fields were drilled with a large seed drill than many of the smaller sites. We've been broadcast seeding, which seem to have much stronger results when it comes to forb growth on the site. And so that field you're seeing ahead of us, um, I believe had 150 different species from remnant sites put down on it. So um, it's an absolute opportunity um, for people to see management-wise the difference between drilling and broadcast seeding. Um, a lot of Agricultural based conservation work is done with seed drills, um, but broadcast seeding can provide absolutely phenomenal results. There's numerous lakes on the park side, as you can see, and uh, there's no access other than walking in right now. Um, but the largemouth bass and some of these ponds are phenomenal, and many anglers are heading into the site. You can see an area of eastern red cedar that needs to be taken down. The park site does have a forestry mower. And when they have time, and depending on the project list for the winter, we are going to be attacking these eastern red cedars and eliminating them. And then now we're looking at this riparian forest. So it's one of the most stunning forests in the Kansas City area, um, where you can see an almost untouched riparian corridor that is just not full of invasive species. And then we just have numerous future pastures that we're ready to put into prairie. The field we're over right now would be slated to be converted next year. And the field we're about to pivot over is full of burn piles. We had a heavy equipment operator just pulling trees out of the ground and a large locust coming out. And this winter staff will be burning brush pile after brush pile. And then we'll begin the conversion process for this pasture as well. And so it's a very slow methodical process to get these fields um, killed off and ready to accept the prairie seed. And so, the scale of Big Bull Creek when you're hiking there is just hard to understand until you get this drone footage and you get an idea of how immense this tall grass prairie is for Johnson County. It's not immense for the Flint Hills um, or Eastern Kansas, but for Johnson County to, to be aiming towards a 500 acre prairie restoration, um, it's a pretty large scale project for us. And that's I-35 in the distance. Um, when it, people talk about the Monarch Corridor, I-35 is the Monarch Butterfly Corridor, and that is cool to have a huge prairie that has I-35 through it as a teaching tool. Um, and if you're ever out on the site, um, the silos, as I said, are iconic. And down the road, um, through our art planning project system, Johnson County, you know, we kind of theorized maybe there could be some art involved in the silos. You know, could we pierce them and put LED lights in them? Could light come out of them? Um, could they be painted? Um, I, I'm interested personally in, you know, if there's some sort of art we could do with the silos. Um, that's an opportunity, um, but that would be a, one of our, you know, art planning commission groups that would decide if that's a viable project. Um, but they are quite unique, you know, could they be platform towers that you could go up in and, and take a look at the surrounding habitat? You know, that's always a possibility as well. Uh, currently, uh, they have no public access, but if there were an observation tower down the road, I think it could be a unique opportunity to provide um, a different look when you're out hiking um, on the site. And you can see the large intermodal um, train rail yard to the north of the site when all this land was purchased. Um, that was not a known project, um, but it is surrounding the whole north and east side of the park now. So um, future projects. Um, what I'm really excited about starting in the next couple of years is a savanna restoration. 
we have two forks of a creek coming together with some enormous kind of wolf oaks, some enormous bur oaks that have grown to the ground and then they curl back up because they've been untouched. And the idea is going to be open up some of the successional forest and kind of degraded pasture and begin to convert that into maybe what an open savanna would have looked like um, pre-settlement. And so that's an important project that I think the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has showed some interest in helping us with. And so the Savannah Gladish complex is going to be a neat future project. And there is a former rail line that goes through that area that will become a paved trail. So overall, that's kind of the Big Bull Creek restoration complex in a, in a nutshell. Thank you again for joining us this afternoon. And thank you, Matt, for taking us on this tour and giving us the overview. So at this time, we are going to look at the Q&A box and the, I just lost the chat box. I'll find that in a second. And um, you can answer some questions. So the first question from Bill is, I can't read street names on the screen. Whoops, there's, where'd it go? There it is. Um, <clears throat> Is, shoot. Um, what number of streets frame the park and are Martin and other creeks tributaries of the Blue River? Um, so the north side of the park site is framed by 56 Highway. And, um, and it's separated again, um, I believe 207th is would be 207th and Sunflower would be about the center of the park site. Um, so that would be the best kind of street indicator to be in the middle of the park site would be a 207th street just on the south side of Edgerton. Very good. Um, Robert asked, have you considered selective grazing instead of fire? Um, we are interested in grazing and we've had some conversations um, about that. The scale of what we're doing is just on the, if it was a little bit bigger, you know, if we had 3,000 acres, it would be really easy to do that. Um, we have some issues legally within the park system with um, allowing a public use or a private use on public land. Um, so we have a hard time getting hang done and we would have the same time with a, a producer getting cattle on it. Um, and so I it's something we would love to introduce, um, but legally trying to find a way to allow the private use um, and getting some sort of a, a bid put together where that was allowed and we had the control to um, pull the cattle before they do too much damage on the site, um, doing some sort of a patch burn grazing combo. Um, it's something we're interested in, but we're not quite there uh, legally. Got it. So Sharon asks, will you be able to remediate any st soil sterilization beneath the burn piles? Yeah, um, we, we burn a lot of burn piles. And generally, once we've cleaned them up and they set a season and we heavily seed them um, with warm season grass, they generally take um, within a couple growing seasons. Um, so we don't have to amend the soil. We've generally had a pretty good just... I guess success rate with just overseeding with a high seeding rate and giving it time and they eventually bounce back. Very good. <clears throat> Harold asks, are there any bottomland hardwood on the site and can that be restored? Yeah, there actually are um, and they don't, they're in good shape. Um, we have some pretty cool um, bottomland hardwood on the south end of the property and, and a little bit on the east side, um, but they're actually in pretty good shape. Very good. Hunter asks a great question for those new to the subject. What's the difference between a prairie and savanna? Sure, so that savanna landscape is not something we see around Kansas City a lot. You hear about a lot in Wisconsin and Minnesota and Illinois, places like that. And so generally a savanna, I'm not sure what the textbook definition is, but to me, it's like a tall grass prairie inter, inter mince, I guess you have big oaks um, throughout um, a tall grass prairie. So it's more of a woodland prairie complex um, with a lot of um, similar tall grass species that you would see, but it's just not something you see in the Kansas City area. But our ideal final product is going to be a large opened oak woodland um, with fire resistant baroque surrounded by tall grass prairie um, in some kind of successional brush um, long term. Very good. Uh, so what is the best time for a controlled burn to encourage uh, native flowers? Um, that's a great question. Um, so we try to do almost all of our burning during the dormant season. And so 
really, if it wasn't snowing and being icy this week, uh, we would be putting fire on the ground from now until March. We've learned over time that burning in the late spring really stimulates the big grasses. And many of our early prairie restorations in the park system um, that were planted grass heavy and then burned repeatedly in late spring have turned into just big blue stem disasters. And so we're not perfect, but we're getting better at doing dormant season fire to stimulate the, the wildflowers and um, trying to stay away from those late, late spring fires. And due to the Flint Hill Smoke Management Plan, Johnson County is actually limited from burning in April. Um, and sometimes, depending on the season, by mid-March, we could have lots of reptiles in some of these restorations. Um, the, the ornate box turtles and the snakes are out. And so some seasons we're trying to, we're, we aim to be done by mid-March. Um, we did try a growing season fire on Cerecia lespediza this year um, in October, I guess it was late September. And that's something we're toying with some occasional growing season fires, which produce kind of a modeled habitat type with some stuff up and down uh, when we're done. But generally for the work we do in trying to get the Forbes stimulated, we are doing dormant season fire. Very good. We have, uh, so Julie from K the Kansas City Art Institute said they might be interested in an art project with, for the silos. Oh yeah. So um, Mary, who is also um, listening in and helping us manage this podcast, Mary, will you help us connect Julie and Matt after this, uh, after the webinar so we can get this going? Sure. Uh, Chris, oh, asks, yeah. Chris asks, would it be, would it help if there was a county ordinance prohibiting calorie pair from adjacent <laughs> private land? Or just in general, maybe. <laughs> sure. um, I was actually just talking with the Kansas Forest Service about that yesterday. Um, we were on a different park site, and they're doing some remote sensing work on calorie pair and specifically looking at the DNA of the calorie pair and genetic um, separated families of calorie pair. And so we are probably going to be a test site for this uh, USDA program. And because they have not gotten calorie pair even on herbicide labels yet. Um, so trying to get it listed as a state noxious weed is important probably versus county because that comes from the state. And then um, being able to have it labeled on herbicides and then um, yeah, stopping the sale of it um, is also critically important. So calorie pair coming um, from numerous neighbors is, is something we fight on every park site. Yeah, it's unfortunate. Um, it's, I think that's one of our biggest challenges is uh, not only just encouraging people to plant natives, but to don't plant things that are, are aggressive and can invade the surrounding natural areas. So it's such a challenge. So Elizabeth asks, what time of year do you overseed prairie areas? Um, we like to overseed in the dead of winter on snow. Um, staff love cab tractors because it is not pleasant to go out in the dead of winter um, without a cab and put that seed down. So um, we love putting the seed down onto snow and letting, um, when it melts, it get locked down into the soil and freeze thaw, uh, do its action, uh, lock the seed down in the soil, um, and then we're ready to go during the growing season. So as soon as the fires are done, hopefully in December and January, we'll be overseeding many of the areas of the park with additional forb seed. Very good. So uh, Brian asked, are the only trailheads and parking off of Sunflower Road and the other off of 213th Street. And then is the 213th Street trailhead open to the public or just for the group camp? Great questions. Um, so right now um, there is public access on the north end of the park at the maintenance compound. That's where the disc golf course is. And I believe there are soon to be future paved trails coming out of that area. You can't quote me on when. Um, and then in the middle area, the single track trailhead is the sunflower entrance. Um, so if you're going to the playground and the shelters and the single track eight mile system, that's all from Sunflower. Um, the scout camp at this time is going to be private access only. Um, I think there is a project in the works um, to have public access to that site. Um, and I'm not sure what the time frame is for that. Um, there is walk-in hunting access to Hillsdale Lake at the end of our road there. So you could park down at the Hillsdale Lake access on 213th and, and walk into the park site from the south end. Um, but generally speaking, um, the bathrooms and the public access are easiest from Sunflower. 
Very good. Carolyn asks, how do you remove the cedar trees and what do you do with them? Also, do you recommend small burn piles versus large ones that you use that you use repeatedly? Then versus one large one that you use sure. repeatedly. Yeah. Um, so it depends on the size of the cedar tree. Um, our staff have a forestry mower on a skid steer which has spinning teeth. And most small to mid-sized eastern red cedars are shredded into mulch immediately. Um, it's a soft tree and when it hits the mulcher, it explodes and it just becomes fresh, good smelling mulch. Um, when they get bigger than that, we actually have an on-call contractor with an excavator. And we have found our most cost-effective way is grabbing them and just yanking them out of the ground and making burn piles. And we are not doing repeated burn piles. We're doing a one-time pile burning and then moving on. So we're not using an area over and over again. Um, once the initial brush piles, small brush piles are burned, we're, we're moving on um, to other areas and finishing that. And then we wouldn't have any more work in that area. Um, but burning brush piles um, is one of those things where the, it's not exciting or fun until you turn away to go start another one and you look and your brush pile is creeping over to the next brush pile. So we've got to make sure that even though it's not as dangerous as burning prairies, that we pay attention when you've got 10 or 15 brush piles burning. That makes sense. Uh, Carla would like to know if there's any results from the bird surveys yet, and if you, what does it show? Um, we only have two seasons, uh, so we don't have a lot of data on our three transects. Um, the data we're showing is that the grassland birds are on site. Um, so we know baseline from, from the first year we had prairie on the ground that we have Henslow sparrows. We've got scissor tail flycatchers. We've got the grasshopper sparrows. We've got, um, we know they're all here. The bobolinks are, you know, are on the site and um, the dick thistles are on the site. So we're seeing the numbers and we don't have enough to have like a trend line yet. So we're excited in maybe five years to see that the, the habitat is, is making uh, the breeding bird survey look uh, promising. But in general, grassland bird numbers are crashing. So we're hoping the size of the core prairie is enough to offset maybe some of those declines that we're seeing in the region. Um, so I don't think we have quite enough data and our long-term monitoring of our plant vegetation hasn't started yet. So the next few years are gonna be important. I have reached out to the Kansas Biological Survey at KU and about maybe with some of these new prairies coming online, if they're doing research on mycorrhizae and um, soil types and different projects they're working on, we'd love for it to be a learning lab for KU. Um, and so I did this exact presentation for them two weeks ago. And we had quite a few interested professors and grad students. And we loved it to be kind of a learning laboratory where uh, a student could start a project with the first year of prairie was planted. Um, so there's pretty unlimited potential if we have universities involved. That's wonderful. So Chris asked if you've been able to document any rare flowers in the prairies, uh, specifically asked about orchids, but I'm gonna add to that. It seems like you've also identified um, some not the same for insects, I believe, is that correct? Um, we, so there is no original prairie on this site. Um, when I use okay. the term prairie restoration, um, Larry Rizzo, my friend would smack me and he calls it a reconstruction, I say restoration. Okay. Um, that there was no burned out old pickup truck to restore here. We were starting with nothing. Um, so we have no original prairie on the site other than a couple little tree lines. Um, we have some really cool remnant forest, but every piece of upland on this site had been either put into corn, soybeans, or cool season grass. So there is no original remnant habitat left in the uplands. And that's why getting that seed for Miami County and bringing it up and having some of that local genetics um, on the site was important versus the commercial seed we buy as well. Very good. I'm going to make an announcement because I've had a couple people ask about recordings. And yes, we will be offering a recorded version of this webinar. They'll probably, we'll clean it up a little bit and probably have it available within the next week at our website, which is deeprootskc.org. I'm going to end with one final question from Robert. And that is, are there any plans to link trails from Bull Creek to Kill Creek or others? Um, I think the long answer is yes. Um, I know that there's been studies to how we can connect the trails into Gardner. Um, I think that is the first step. Currently getting from um, Big Bull Creek into Gardner um, is a possibility along the I-35 corridor. Um, there's nothing formal there. It's just kind of looking at ideas. 
Um, I believe the Kill Creek Trail currently stops at 143rd in Waverly. And so it is still quite a ways away um, from connecting Kill Creek to Bull Creek. And I don't know that that project has really been um, vetted out yet, but if we could get Kill Creek eventually into Gardner and then have a trail that would go from Gardner along 35 into Bull Creek, that's probably um, long-term um, in the next 20, 25 years where I would see that connection happening. Um, but whenever citizens are surveyed in the county, trails are the number one thing they want. Um, so generally speaking, um, that's one of the most crucial things for citizens in Johnson County. And we love um, providing that. And so I, I think long-term, you probably will see some of those connections made. Wonderful. Terrific questions this afternoon and a terrific presentation. Thank you. So thank you again for joining the webinar today over the lunch hour. We hope that you will also find our deeprootskc.org website to be a great resource. We can help you find native plants, plan, plan a garden, and more. If you like what you've heard today and would like to support Deep Roots and our webinar series, please consider making a donation. In fact, we have a group of matching donors who will match donations of $250 or more up to $25,000. So thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you again for joining us this afternoon. If you missed our September conference, Planet Native, the recording library is now available. To learn more, please visit that website at planetnative.org. So thank you for joining us. Matt, thank you very much as always for sharing your expertise and vision and honestly for um, you know, taking all of these acres and um, what, was the, what was your preferred re word? Res restoring them yeah. <laughs> back to what they could be. <laughs> Great. Thanks so much for everyone for joining us and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks.